We're good. Okay. Uh, just first up, a couple of uh, references and resources. Uh, so after my talk on Monday, um, I guess I, I realized that the, the ideas behind, you know, the theoretical ideas behind resonance and all of these types of things with sudden warmings. Uh, I gave you the literature, but I won't lie, it's, uh, it is a non-trivial uh, literature mathematically. Um, and often those authors uh, are very good at doing the clever math, but perhaps not so great at translating that into physics. Um, so in this paper of mine that I've cited, uh, there are three sections that if you want background on kind of the theory, but you want it written in English or, you know, uh, more simple language, uh, the introduction in those two sections in 4A and 4B will give you background that really translates that. I, it, the, the paper is sort of long, but the reason why it's long is because I tried to translate uh, the theory into, into physics. So it, you might find that helpful if you're interested. Second, uh, I know a lot of the talks uh, have been making use of like RMM and all those various MJO indices. And I just wanted to point out that in uh, my section at NOAA Ezra, uh, we have an MJO indices webpage. And that has links to Matt Wheeler's website that will give you time series of RMM. But in addition, uh, no one has mentioned the OMI index. Uh, and that is a index that's uh, maintained locally at NOAA. And you can get time series of that there. And I should just point out that uh, in some sense, the way to think about the, those two indices is RMM takes circulation and OLR. But for the most part, it's really just a circulation indice. Uh, it's not to say that it's not related to OLR. But if you remove OLR from RMM and you correlate it uh, with, with, with and without OLR, it's correlated at like 0.9. So it's really a, a circulation indice. The OMI, on the other hand, is purely based on OLR. Uh, so if you want to look at those two types of things, the circulation, no all our indice, uh, this is a great resource. So, uh, and then the, the paper by George Colatus, I put the citation for that down there. So that might be useful to some of you. That's got nothing to do with my talk. I don't work on the MJO, but there you go. Okay, so the focus of my talk will be on strat stratospheric troposphere communication. Uh, and in particular, in the context of extratropical tropical communication and sudden warmings. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly go into a little bit of the mechanistic understanding, which uh, has been around for 30 years, but is still poor. But I'll try to give you a, a, an overview of that. And then uh, I will talk about predictability, probabilistic predictability, not deterministic like my previous talk, in the context of ENSO, QBO, and sun warmings. Okay, so most of the talks that we've heard, okay, all of the talks, uh, <laughs> have focused on things like tropical SSTs and the tropospheric teleconnection pathway, right? So that's like, say, the jet stream response, and then you get a Rossby response and, and, and those types of things, uh, all within the troposphere. However, there's also what uh, is called the stratospheric pathway. And kind of broadly, a way to think about this is like, so say you have an El Nino going on, and that SST anomaly uh, drives a, a stationary planetary wave response. And that wave response goes into the stratosphere, and it affects the stratospheric polar vortex as opposed to the, pol the, the, the tropospheric vortex. And that signal goes up, uh, does something to the stratospheric polar vortex, and then that sig signal comes back down. So uh, that's kind of in a very broad sense a two-way two process. First is you've got to, you know, you get the signal that goes up, but then you've got to communicate it back downwards to the tropopause. And I've listed out uh, a set of ideas that are kind of theoretical constructs that have proposed how this might work. Uh, I won't lie to you, uh, there isn't a smoking gun at this point. Um, I'm gonna go through one of them that I find to be more compelling, uh, but you shouldn't forget that all of these exist. <laughs> that response then is amplified, so, um, and I'll kind of show uh, in the next slide how that might work, uh, but essentially you imprint something on the triple pause, and then there's a synoptic eddy feedback that amplifies that response. Okay, so, I'm gonna focus on, just so you can get an idea how this might work, on the remote response to the stratospheric PV anomalies, okay? So I just wrote the uh, perturbation uh, QG 
PV equation. And kind of this middle piece, you know, it's got all these geometric terms and whatever, and it looks sort of complicated maybe. But <laughs> really, you could just distill it down to the fact that it's a three-dimensional uh, elliptic operator. And anybody, I don't know if anyone's worked on uh, partial dif differential equation theory, but an elliptic operator, this is a linear operator. What it means is, is when you invert that, so you, once you have the PV, you can invert that to get things like geopotential and the winds and things like that. Uh, and that invertibility is non-local. So what that means is, is if I have a PV anomaly in the stratosphere or the troposphere, I invert that, there's a wind and geopotential response that is a broad field response and it's not just at that point, okay? It's also a linear operator, so we can do what's called piecewise uh, PV inversion. So this is from a paper, uh, I think I gave the wrong, no, that's the right reference, I was thinking that was the black paper. Anyway, essentially what you can do is you can say, okay, well, I'm gonna take a PV field and I'm gonna invert it and get a zonal wind profile. So this box right here on the far left, in the upper corner, is a zonal wind profile in latitude and pressure for tropospheric and PV uh, field in its entirety. Then, as I said, it's a linear operator, so we can split that into, okay, let's look at the tropospheric and stratospheric portions of that PV anomaly separately, invert them separately, and then figure out what their uh, implied wind response is due to those two PV anomalies. And what you see is, is that the tropospheric PV anomaly gives you this wind response that's largely, uh, you know, lowermost stratosphere down to the surface. Uh, and if we invert the stratospheric PV anomaly, we get something that's largest in the stratosphere, but you again, you see this large scale structure that bleeds all the way down in the troposphere, okay? And so if you look at that on say the 215 hectopascal geopotential, in terms of the uh, 215 uh, hectopascal geopotential height anomaly, this is the full field, tropospheric plus stratospheric PV. This is the geopotential uh, that results from the tropospheric portion of the PV inversion, and this bottom piece is a stratospheric PV inversion. So kind of what you can broadly, qualitatively interpret here is this is, you know, something happens in the stratosphere, changes the PV uh, polar vortex uh, strength in the stratosphere. You get this kind of large scale imprint on the upper troposphere. Um, and then the tropospheric part is this, you know, higher wave number uh, kind of pattern. And that's, that's the contribution there. There's no ca causality there, but you should just kind of keep in the back of your mind that, that, that something happens in the stratosphere, it imprints something on the troposphere, and then there's probably some sort of feedback with, with, the strat with uh, tropospheric uh, anomalies. So uh, this is any of these theories, whether it's, you know, I mentioned wave reflection, down, downward control, any of these are, you have to take that, uh, translate that, that polar vortex anomaly in the stratosphere, get it to the tropopause so that you can then uh, alter tropospheric weather. Okay. So, anything, heat anomaly, any, anything that's gonna alter PV, right? So, drive a planetary wave from, uh, anomalously large planetary wave from, say, an El Nino event, drives a stationary planetary wave, planetary wave into the stratosphere, weakens the polar vortex, that's a PV anomaly that's gonna then imprint something non-locally. All right, so this left panel is what's called the, uh, nominally the dripping paint diagram. Uh, and this goes back to uh, Baldwin and Dunkerton in 1999. And what they did was, is they calculated uh, the northern annular mode, which is just, uh, and they did this in the, the stratosphere, I believe, but it doesn't, it doesn't much matter. Essentially the way to think about this is that uh, when you have the polar vortex, uh, when it's strong, uh, and there's not a lot of wave activity in the stratosphere. Uh, the vortex is very broad and strong. If there's a lot of wave activity and a lot of wave drag, it, it slows down uh, the vortex and you get a contracted and weak vortex. And essentially what they did was they um, composited, these are, this is at lag, uh, plus and minus, for, uh, I forget what the time series, maybe it went back to 1979 or the 50s or something like that. The point is, is that they composited 18 weak vortex events and 30 strong vortex events. And there's been a lot of discussion. This, you know, this looks like some sort of downward signal propagation, right? 
something starts in the stratosphere at zero lag and then it bleeds down in the troposphere. There's a lot of argument about whether that's the correct interpretation of that. Yes? Yeah. Because it's extremely long, there's a tremendous amount of filtering that is done to produce that. Yes. That is accurate. Um, and there's, you know, but, uh, you know, Dave Thompson and, and, and Mark Baldwin recently, not super recently, but wrote a paper on all of these various indices. And if you go into the stratosphere, uh, all those indices, whether it's the NAM, they owe, whether you use geopotential or UFs or whatever you use, essentially get, get broadly the same result. And uh, this, this is a recent uh, plot. And instead of just weak and strong vortex events, uh, this is for sudden warming events, right? So in a sub, sub, sudden warming event is just a subset of weak events. It's particularly very strong events, right? So that's when the vortex breaks down. And you get um, a, a very similar pattern. So if you look at this um, at, say, you know, various surfaces in the troposphere uh, in terms of mean sea level pressure, surface temperature anomalies, or uh, precip anomalies, and the hatching shows where things are significant, you see what those patterns, this is 60 days out from a central warming date, right? So a sudden warming happens, and then 60 days, and you integrate and to, to find out what the anomaly patterns look like, and this is what you get. Uh, in particular, for a sudden warming, you get a uh, negative NAO pattern. You can, you can see that uh, when you look at these structures. Okay, so those are just kind of the broad basic characteristics of what happens when you strong weak vortex events and sudden warmings. What does that mean in the context of other uh, previously kind of thought of as tropospheric teleconnection patterns? Okay, so I'm gonna show a series of plots from model results, all these model results that I'm gonna show you, uh, they're various, this is uh, ECHM from uh, Max Planck, and they're all uh, very long runs, a lot of ensembles, and so there's a lot of statistical power in these. Um, but they are all model runs. So this is uh, plots in the top row uh, of 5 hect 5 hect 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies. And on the left, we have the model predictions. And on the right, we have error interim. And so this is the two months after uh, a sudden warming. And what we see, did someone, no, I'm just hearing things, okay. Uh, in the two months after a sudden warming, you get this uh, negative NAO pattern, um, and yet that shows up both in model and in error interim. Uh, and on the bottom panel, what they uh, plotted is El Nino, uh, both in the model and for error interim. And again, you get kind of this similar pattern. Okay, so what happens if you try to separate out the effects of uh, kind of the sudden warming from just pure El Nino? Is this sort of there? Yes. Sudden warming can only happen in, in DGF. So, um, yes, all these plots are, it, for the, stra the stratosphere primarily only has an influence on things in the winter because uh, the Charney Drazen condition says that, uh, you know, you cap wave activity uh, during other parts of the year. So you really have a boring stratosphere during, during summer. So, okay, so then they took this and they sliced their data into, time periods with El Nino with a sudden warming and time periods of El Nino without a sudden warming. And part of the problem with looking at just reanalysis data is by the time you chop it all up, right, you only have a few El Nino cycles, you only have a handful of warmings, by the time you chop it up, you're left with essentially nothing. Um, so that's the whole point of trying to do a lot of these uh, simulations with a lot, uh, a lot of ensembles to get more statistical power. Now, interestingly, what happens is we get a, when you look at El Nino with sudden warmings, you get this kind of similar pattern that we looked at before, right? And that's, that's not surprising. However, if you look at El Nino without sudden warmings, uh, you get a very, very different picture, okay? So what this is, and, and it, it, the, the El Nino with sudden warmings, if you notice, uh, looks very similar <laughs> to, you know, all sudden warming periods or all El Nino periods. And I think the, one of the messages they're trying to take away there is that, yes, El Nino in the tropospheric pathway gives you, gives you something strong, but a good portion of that is likely due to the fact that you also have, uh, in the data record, you have sudden warmings going on during those years. And when you collect them all together on aggregate, you're seeing a big imprint from the stratosphere. And it's not just the tropospheric pathway from El Nino. Okay, so what about El Nino versus La Nina? 
And as I said, uh, you know, when you have a sudden warming, it imprints typically a, a negative NAO pattern. And if you take, uh, these are, again, 500 hectopascal anomalies, um, height anomalies, and the top row is El Nino, the bottom row is La Nina, and uh, you have for all years, and again, these are, uh, these are N NGAR CAMP5 simulations, you get these kind of opposite pattern, right, for El Nino versus La Nina. And if you look at with uh, sudden warming, uh, it looks essentially the same for El Nino, uh, perhaps a bit stronger. And for La Nina, it's slightly weaker than the all case. And then if you look uh, at the no sudden warming, um, and you subtract the, no, the, the with minus no sudden warming, what you see is this identical pattern. And that's that imprint of that negative NAO pattern, right? So um, whether or not you, you know, the, the, you have essentially the way to look at this is, I think, in a simplified sense, is, is that you have the tropospheric pathway that's going on, that El Nino versus La Nina. But if you then imprint on top of that a sudden warming, uh, you're going to get the aggregate effect of that tropospheric uh, pathway plus the stratospheric pathway, which is a negative NAO effect. Obviously, that's a simplified linear way of thinking about this, but broadly, if you're trying to get a conceptual handle on these things, that's maybe the way to look at it. This is another way of saying the exotropic atmosphere is noisy. Say again? Isn't, isn't this just a different way of saying the exotropic atmosphere is noisy? And during an Inger event, you find no, it's not. La Nina event, you find uh, I probably wouldn't interpret it that way. Um, Just here, as I said, okay, I have a Nino and I have positive NAO. It's clearly different from that. A Nino and not positive NAO. The structure looks different by definition, right? It's almost the same as what I do here. They have to look different by definition. Sure. Sudden warming produced negative NAO. That's the, yeah, I mean, so that's the, this is not a, I mean, I don't, wouldn't argue that that's a noise, no, imp, imprint of noise. No, but it's just saying that it's not noise. It's just saying, okay, if I have a negative NAO, or it is equivalent to having a sudden stratospheric warming, mm -hmm. then I get the signal that can be superimposed to El Nino and then, or not superimposed to El Nino, that gives me different response. It's just saying that the exotropic atmosphere is, can have this noise pattern or whatever you want to call it uh, that can superimpose on the exotropic. I guess I'm, I'm not following. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to. This is what he's saying. Right. Right. What's that? The conclusion is that sudden warming produces negative energy outside, and it has nothing to do with that meaning. Uh, that's an open sort of, that's, a, that's sort of an, that's sort of an open, but yeah, well, I mean, the argument is, 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 is as, as I'll show that uh, sudden warmings have a tendency to occur more during both La Nina and El Nino, why that occurs, uh, that's, that's sort of an open question. But I mean, I, sh sure, let's, let's, let's talk afterward, let me. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, this is this is at lag, so that's unlikely. Um, I don't, I don't think it's an N, the NAO is not causing a warming. But all right, uh, I'm not going to go through this. I just wanted people to have this reference. Uh, it looks at Central Pacific versus East Pacific uh, El Nino, and there's there's some, I guess, some more rich behavior depending on how you chop up the, the data. Okay, so that's kind of the broad understanding of, of and so. Um, what about the quasi-binial oscillation? So um, I'm not sure whether people, how familiar people are with it, but uh, broadly, uh, the equatorial QBO is an oscillation in wind, and up here I've just shown time series, and these are uh, easterly versus westerly downward propagating zonal wind anomalies, and this is a wave-driven effect. Essentially what you have here is, um, if you look, uh, this is height versus latitude, uh, and you have generation of, of uh, Kelvin waves, mixed Rossby gravity waves, gravity waves, those propagate up into the into the stratosphere, and those are differentially fil differentially filtered dependent on whether it's east, uh, whether you have easterlies or westerlies. And so, one spectrum of waves can go up during easterlies, 
uh, while the others are capped, and uh, they drive a descending, uh, one descending branch. Then when that branch is ascended, it, you switch, and the other spectrum of waves are allowed to propagate up, and they drive the reversed cycle. And so you get this alternating uh, wind anomaly pattern. Now, in addition to that, over the tropics, what that does is this is a zero wind line. It essentially uh, takes that zero wind line and it breathes it in and out in the latitudinal sense, okay? So uh, when you have, the, the way that that's important is, uh, broadly speaking, you have planetary waves that propagate out of the troposphere into the stratosphere, and as you move this zero wind line in and out, you constrict that wave activity uh, to stay more uh, towards the pole or allow it to escape more towards the equator. It's a bit more complicated than that, but in a very kind of schematic, broad sense, uh, that's the way to think about it. Okay, so what might that look like? Um, so, just so that we understand, uh, during the westerly phase, this line is moved more uh, equatorward, and in the easterly phase, the zero in line moves more towards the pole. So when it moves more towards, more towards the pole, you kind of hold more wave activity in. And if you look at the difference, the QBO west minus east, uh, this is co-author's mind. I, I prefer to look, look at the east minus west because the west is sort of like a non-signal because climatologically waves propagate up and they go equatorward. It's really during the east when you're pinching it that you're changing things. Um, nevertheless, uh, this is error interim and error 40 and this is for a like, very large ensemble of, of NCAR CAM5 runs, and you essentially get the, the, the same deal. And essentially what happens is uh, uh, during QBO East, as I said, you kind of constrict things, you hold more wave activity in, and you get a weaker uh, polar vortex. Okay, well, what does that look like in terms of sea level pressure? Uh, so you can see that you get this kind of similar pattern. Uh, those contours are, <laughs> half a hectopascal or something like that. So it's, uh, from my perspective, it's kind of a shrug. Um, meh, you know, that's, that's not a big effect. Okay, why might I be bringing up the QBO then if uh, it has such a weak, it's, if the QBO itself has such a weak uh, surface uh, anomaly? Well, it's because the QBO has, the two phases have some preference as far as sudden warmings. Um, so, what this is a plot of here is, uh, this is on the, on the vertical axis, this is a measure of what the, is called the Holton and Tan effect. That breathing in and out is what's called the Holton and Tan effect. That's due to a paper that was written in 1980 by, uh, by Jim Holton. And what we're doing here is correlating uh, the strength of that, that Holton and Tan effect with the frequency of sudden warmings. And you see that it's very, very well correlated. Uh, down at the bottom, what we've done is we've done it for both phases. And what you see is, is during the QBO West, there's essentially, this is a non-significant correlation of 0.35. Uh, and during East, there's an extremely high correlation, right? So that's 0.91. Um, and so essentially what this is telling you is, is that when that zero wind line is very, uh, is encroaching strongly poleward, you're getting more sudden warmings. Uh, so, and as I said, that's consistent with the idea that the easterly phase is really a signal and the westerly phase is largely just a, a weak climatological signal. Okay, so um, the QBO is a 28-month oscillation, right? And that period, that's, you know, it's plus or minus a few months. This, uh, except for this last year where we had a disrupt disruption of the QBO, uh, this looks like this and will continue to look like this barring some sort of catastrophe. Uh, so it's very predictable, right? So you could imagine that if we know what phase of QBO we're in and we know probabilistically what that means in terms of uh, sudden warmings, that might give us some sort of uh, seasonal predictive skill on um, the NAO provided the NAO doesn't trigger warmings or any of the, the questions uh, notwithstanding. What about ENSO? Um, so what I've done here is I've taken, these are, I, I, I created tables from two different papers. And essentially the takeaway message here is that um, El Nino and La Nina typically compared to, oh, I didn't include neutral. Uh, I think neutral is like about 0.6 sudden warmings. Uh, per decade, uh, or like six sudden warmings per decade. Uh, during El Nino and La Nina, there's an elevated number of warmings. 
it is a open question why that is. Um, I should point out that El Nino, it has been strongly shown, generates more wave activity that goes into the stratosphere uh, versus La Nina. So it's, as I mentioned the other day, uh, it is likely that it is not just the generation of wave activity issue that's driving the sudden warmings. There's something more subtle about the geometry of the stratospheric polar vortex that's occurring during both La Nina and El Nino. Uh, why did I put up this second box? Because you'll notice that uh, the El Nino and La Nina for the top box are largely uh, close, and then in the second set, uh, they're farther apart. That's because uh, NOAA's SS and SEPS and, uh, SST version four data set uh, is problematic. So if you were and if you were going to use that for something, uh, don't. I don't know if they. I think they may have put out version five in the last few months. Um, you use that because this uh, version four. They were trying to get a lot, uh, do a lot of data correction, and in the end, what it did was it smoothed things, and the uh, interannual variability is much weaker than it should be. And for example, a whole bunch of La Niña's just disappeared. So um, I would say that this most recent paper that relies on that data set is eh, so uh, keep that in the back of your mind. But even the before numbers, I mean, are those two numbers Uh, if you believe that, I mean, this this kind of thing has uh, been in huge ensembles. Has been, yeah, this is data. I like data, but uh, if you chunk it into a model, yeah, yeah. So, provided models are doing sudden warmings correctly, which depending on the model, uh, open question. But yes, this is a consistent result. Okay, uh, I threw this in here. Um, I may have looked, we may have looked at this the other day. Essentially, I just wanted to point out to people that uh, this is a, a set of nudging experiments, and it's just showing enhanced predictability due to different, different types of forcings. So, uh, like, for example, if you take, uh, this is another one of these nudging schemes where you nudge sea surface temperatures, you nudge the tropics, and then you see what kind of uh, skill you get. And for example, uh, this experiment takes climatological SSTs for, and this is for DJF, uh, and they nudge the tropics, right? So that's why the correlation of the tropics is essentially perfect, right? Because you're demanding that the model do the tropics perfect. So really what you want to look at is the extra tropics, right? And you see that when you do that, you get a lot of enhanced skill in the extra tropics, right? Um, if you do the same, same thing where you take climatological SSTs and you nudge the stratosphere, Again, you get a lot of skill, and arguably, again, you have to ignore <laughs> the perfect part that you nudged and look at the extra tropics. And you know, if you look at the two, they're they're pretty comparable. So uh, the takeaway message that a lot of these studies have been looking at, and this is this doesn't even include warmings, right? This is just kind of uh, average behavior. So this is this just the vortex in the stratosphere being strong and weak, uh, with the occasional sudden warming thrown in there. So, noise-wise, uh, what does this mean in terms of prediction? So this is another series of uh, nudging experiments, but this takes, and, uh, takes the Canadian model, and essentially what they did was is they uh, nudged to two types of warmings, the displacement and the split, and then they did a ton of ensembles where the stratosphere was nudged to that state, and then they let the, the troposphere be free run and looked at the result. So if you look at the, the daily NAM indice for JFM, uh, for the control and the two types of warming, splits and displacements, what you see is, 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 as I mentioned, you see this shift in the PDF towards negative NAO, right? Um, and essentially what you see here uh, is this is, you know, the warmings are triggered, you know, I guess they were late December here. And what you see is in the ensemble mean, you get a tendency for there to be a negative NAM or negative NAO event, right? However, if you look at all those gray lines, those are the ensembles, right? So that's your noise, right? So uh, in a probabilistic sense, you get something, but you have to be careful uh, because there's a lot of noise. But 
that's no different than looking at tropospheric teleconnections. If we look at the, the most recent El Nino uh, that embarrassed all of us at NOAA, uh, you know, you had this, what was supposed to be a Godzilla El Nino, and there was a lot of noise. So uh, a lot of the, the signal that we were expecting to see, or see was uh, a particular, the beginning of the season was largely obscured. So uh, that's just kind of the, the nature of probabilistic seasonal forecasting. Uh, but I think this, this kind of gives you an idea of, of looking at the noise versus the, the signal. Okay, how are we doing on, let's see, what time, what time are we? Okay, very good, because then I get to talk about stuff that I've actually worked on, yay. All right, so, so far, I've talked to you about this stratospheric teleconnection pathway and kind of looked at the difference between that and, and the tropospheric. I kind of subscribe, most of these views are predicated on the notion that you have two regions, and you take the tropopause and you draw a line through it, and uh, depending on your view, if you're Nick, uh, I'm, the stratosphere is a sponge layer that's just absorbing things. Uh, if you are, what's that? This is George. <laughs> he just humbly laughs along, agreeingly. Uh, if you're stratospheric dynamics, the tropopause is a lower boundary condition. It's just a noisemaker that helps produce variability because no one cares about the troposphere anyway, right? Um, I, I don't take that view. I really think, um, and I, I mentioned in my last talk that there were, I, I didn't really talk about his theories, but I, I told you to go read a bunch of Alan O'Neill papers. And one of the things that I like about his set of papers is he thinks about uh, sudden warmings in a more vertically deep sense, okay? So there isn't, this, this tropopause is, yes, it's a big change in static stability and all kinds of other things, uh, but these vortex structures are very vertically deep, right? PV anomalies are very vertically deep. So I like to think of these things uh, in a more organic, integrated sense, and I will tell you what I mean by that, but just let me set the table a little bit here about knowing two things and why this may, might be important. So this is a plot from Sardish, Muck, and Hoskins, and essentially all you want to take into account here is if you look at the, the black dot, uh, he just took uh, diver divergence forcing and he just moved it, and you can tell that these are the Rossby responses, right? So uh, same basic state that, he, that, that you start with, but if you just move the divergence forcing, you get a very different Rossby response, right? So uh, where we imply divergence forcing makes a big difference. Two, the basic state also matters. Uh, here, if you take December, February basic state or a June, August basic state, leave the divergence force in an identical place, again, you get a very different Rossby response, right? So those are two ingredients that if we alter them, basic state or the location of the divergence forcing, we're gonna get a different, get a different uh, tropospheric teleconnection pattern, Rossby response. All right, so you know, what do we typically, we've been talking about ENSO, MJO, things like that that cause tropical heating and then there's divergent outflow and, and we get a, get a Rossby response. Uh, what might other types of forcings be? Um, this is from a paper from George Pilatus in 98 and essentially at the top level we see PV on the 350K isentrope and essentially what you're seeing here is uh, he, he did some regressions um, what you're seeing is, is the, uh, you know, waves that are coming, they come off the, the, uh, the Asian jet and they propagate out into the Pacific Basin and they propagate down into the subtropics uh, where they break, right? So these are, these are extratropical to tropical waves. And with that uh, wave breaking uh, anomaly we get, uh, this is the divergence and this is the divergent wind. So if we have extratropical waves that propagate into the subtropics and tropics, with it comes, um, comes a divergence forcing. Okay. So, uh, where do they occur? Uh, this is the 350K isentrope, that's about 200 millibars. Uh, zonal wind, and here we see the two jets over Asia and North America, and we see easterlies over South America and most of the maritime continent. And Ross, linear Rossby wave theory tells you that uh, waves are able to propagate where we have westerlies, right? So essentially what happens is you have waves that propagate along the southern edge of these two jets where uh, the elasticity due to the PV gradient kind of holds them together. They propagate out over the ocean and they often then propagate into what are called these westerly ducts. And they're called ducts because uh, we have mostly easterlies 
and then we just have these two openings, right? And here's a PV map on the 350K isentropic surface that shows, uh, you know, kind of what we, what, you, what you're looking for when you see one of these wave breaking events going on, right? Okay, so why are those westerly ducts there? Uh, you'll see a lot in the literature. I'm not gonna go through this deeply, but I just wanted to throw it up there. Uh, this, is a, this, this is from an article that Peter Webster wrote uh, in a cool book that was edited by uh, Brian Hoskins. And essentially, what he talks about there, that these westerly ducts are there from, you have, you know, in the maritime continent, you have a lot of precipitation and that causes this mass circulation, this walker-like circulation that, that drives easterlies, right? And that's what he says, the, the reason for that is. Uh, that's, that may be part of it, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, when you, this is, what I've taken here is air interim winds and broken it into the rotational and diverging component, and this is trim uh, precipitation. What you'll end up seeing is that uh, it doesn't quite match up right, where you have the maximum in precipitation uh, and you would expect uh, outflow like this, the wind's actually uh, the other direction, right where you would expect the largest part of the mass circulation. And you can see that, and it's, it's hard to see here, but you guys can take a, a peek at my slides on your own time. What you'll see is, is that the divergent component is part of it, but really it's, it's the Rossby response that, that sets up these ducts. And you can see that in the rotational wind component. All right, so what does this all have to do with sudden warmings? As I said, uh, most, when you look at wave breaking, it really occurs in these ducts, right? And those occur out of the Pacific and the Atlantic. Well, I was reading a paper and there was local station data over India and they were, they were seeing intense gravity wave activity during the sudden warming of 2009. Uh, and they were saying, well, this is from a PV intrusion. There's a wave breaking and it's emanating gravity waves. And I thought about that and I thought, well, sudden warmings have a geographic preference, right? So uh, when you have a split sudden warming, those two lobes always end up in the same spot when they, when they break, right? And there's, there's some sort of geographic locking, probably to do with the fact that they're largely, uh, a big component of their forcing is, is stationary topography and land-sea contrasts. So I just thought, well, is there a systematic connection between sudden warmings and deep extratropical uh, tropical PV intrusions? So the first thing I did was go on a little bit of a fishing expedition, and I, this is the climatology of wind on the 350K surface, and this is the time period before that warming. And what you see is, is that where you normally have easterlies, there's this huge new duct south of India that's opened up. And I was like, oh, Huh, that's, that's an interesting effect. So let's see if we can quantify this for all sudden warmings. Okay, so just to get an idea of, I mentioned that I like thinking of these things as very vertically deep uh, vortex events. This is the PV field uh, for the split event in 2009, and you can see we've got, you know, there's, you can see this is prior to the, to the event, you can see the two low pressure systems. This is, this is that the vortex getting stretched into that peanut shape and it's about to rip into two. And these would be the two lobes that are being torn apart. You can see that this is up in the mid stratosphere. This is down at 350K right along the tropopause. And this is down all the way at 320K, which definitely dives down into the, uh, deeply into the troposphere. And what you see is, is that this wave number two structure is really deep. You can see it all the way from uh, the upper troposphere, all the way into the deep stratosphere. So it's, I'm not making any sort of causal argument about where, where the, the, the source of this comes, but when it does happen, you get these very beautiful deep vertical structures. Okay, you'll notice that there are wrap up of waves breaking in two locations. All right, so we did some composite building and bootstrapping to try to Establish significance of this, and what you see is, is you see these two dipole patterns that occur in those two specific locations, right? And those are really significant. So what this means is, is the dipole pattern, what is that, okay? Well, when one of these waves break, you have high PV to the north and low PV to the south. And what you're doing is you're transporting that wave breaks, and you're transporting high PV from the north to the south, and low PV to the north. 
right? So this is the mixing process. And it occurs in two very specific locations. So what is the kind of idea that's going on there? Well, as I mentioned before, typically these waves that like George Klaus was looking at are synoptic scale waves. They're propagating along the Asian jet, out over the ocean, and into the duct. So that would be equivalent to having these small scale uh, waves right along, breaking right along the tropopause. Well, the thing that I thought about is you see this very deep vertical structure. And these waves that are breaking in the stratosphere is what Michael McIntyre calls the stratospheric surf zone. So these are breaking waves, but they're not synoptic waves. These are part of the large planetary scale structure. Now, most of the time when the, the polar vortex is contained to the pole, that surf zone wave breaking dynamics is fully in the stratosphere. However, when you start ripping the vortex apart, you start pushing the vortex towards the equator. And when you do that, this wave breaking that used to be fully contained within the stratosphere starts impinging on the tropopause. So it's possible that the aggregate effect of this, you have these two lobes moving southward, is you cause this bulging in the material PV surface that does two things. One is, is that in these two regions, you've got this very vertically deep, large-scale planetary wave breaking that is contributing to these anomalies. And the other is, is that this bowing of the material PV surface, you can kind of think of that, that's the, that's the wave guide, that's, that's the, the, the strongest PV gradient is where Rossby waves live. And so what you're doing is you're warping the waveguide structure for the synoptic waves. So the idea here is, is that those two dipoles that we see are the function of both vertically deep planetary wave breaking and warping of the, of the ways in which synoptic scale waves propagate and break. So we tried to split this uh, into synoptic scale wave breaking by taking a high pass filter and then the large scale low frequency wave breaking by taking a 30 to 120 day filter. And what we found is, is depending on the event and even the daily, you know, uh, you get a mixture of both. So for the 2009 warming, what I've done here is this is the low frequency stream function and this is the synoptic stream function. And if you look here at the bottom, you see this is where we get those two wave breaking centers of action and uh, associated with the PV. And if you look at the synoptic scale on the right first, you'll notice I've taken these plus or minus regions for the synoptic waves and I've imprinted that on here. And it'd be really hard to argue that this wave breaking has much to do with the synoptics. However, if we do the same thing with the low frequency variability, we see this nice tilt, right? And so we see that that's uh, likely the effect of the large scale wave breaking. So kind of the idea here is, is that uh, these are two different events and this is uh, a vertical cross, -sec cross section of PV climatology is that when you have this, this is the, the, the colors are PV on 350 and I've taken this dashed white line is PV at a much higher surface. So essentially what that's just showing you is showing how vertically stacked uh, and vertically deep this PV anomaly is. This wave breaking, if we look uh, in the vertical cross section sense, essentially what you see is, is you can see that these anomalies, these are essentially what's going on. I'll, I'm not gonna, go through this deeply because it, it may take you some time to, to, to see this, but essentially what's going on here is this B, that is this uh, PV wrapping down and through in the cross-section sense, and you see this, uh, the, the, the stratospheric PV is wrapping downwards and inwards around. And along A, where you're taking low PV air, that's this part of the tongue wrapping upward and inwards. So essentially what you're looking at is these are uh, these are modeling results from wave breaking. You're seeing the wrapping up of this filament that's vertically deep and it impinges upon the tropopause and that's where a lot of this mixing is coming in. It's not always just the low frequencies though. Um, here this is a different warming in 1999. Again, we see organization, nice beautiful organization from the low frequency. But in this case, if we look at the synoptic scales and I've connected the wave train, we see this nice, beautiful effect from the synoptic waves. So they certainly, certainly contribute uh, during some of these events. Well, what does this mean? What's our currency? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I said it's where you have divergence and it's the basic state that goes on. So what I've done here is I've taken the divergence climatology um, and then I've 
and it's not showing up very beautifully, but uh, what I've done is I've taken uh, the divergence anomalies uh, from climatology for sudden warmings, and again, uh, where I was showing those PV plots and I showed you the two centers of action, we also get divergence anomalies. Uh, over the Pacific, that essentially projects onto what's already there. When I showed you that picture from George Pilatus, uh, that was a, a regression of climatology, right? So those waves are breaking there all the time. During sudden warmings, you just get, that just, that response just gets amplified, right? So it just projects onto what's already there. However, over the uh, Indian sector uh, to, to kind of far Eastern Europe, that is very different from climatology. It's a totally different sign. On top of that, uh, if we look at the wind pattern, we see that uh, during sudden warmings, when you warp that PV, right? I talked about the invertibil invertibility of PV. You can recover the winds from that. We also get strong deformations in, in what the wind looks like. So the two ingredients that I talked about that are important for tropospheric teleconnections, right? The basic state and the divergence patterns, both of those are altered. So uh, that's kind of my takeaway from that. And do we have like 30 seconds? No. Uh, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay, very good. I just wanted to make uh, the point here about how important that vertical, how vertically deep the sudden warming event is. What I've shown here are two pictures. One is for a February not, or 2010 major sudden stratospheric warming, so it met the definition. And this is PV on 850, and you can see this is a, instead of a split event, this is just a, a wave number one displacement, right? So this is when you just push the vortex off the pole. And if you recall from my previous talk, I said that split sudden warmings are largely barotropic, very, very vertically deep, and displacements have a first baroclinic structure, which means that the largest amplitude of the perturbation is high in the stratosphere, and it decays as you go down. January 2012 was a minor warming. Doesn't show up in any of the data records, it certainly is hard to argue that it looks any different than the major sudden warming. So what does it mean uh, in terms of what's going on down at the tropopause? If we look at the low frequency stream function for the major sudden stratospheric warming event, this is the low frequency stream function. If I showed you climatology, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference because it's identical. The synoptic scale stream function You'll notice that these, those, uh, the synoptic, the, the, the wave breaking that I showed before it extends down to say 10, uh, you know, way deeply. Here, this is synoptic scale wave breaking, but it's pretty far north and it's more kind of climatological because there's no low frequency variability to warp the PD. However, if we look at the minor warming, we see now there's this strong imprint on the low frequency variability. And with that, we see this nice, we can see, look, this, these PV events are reaching down all the way to the equator. And again, it's a function of both the low frequency and the warped synoptic scale variability. So the important part here is, is that um, I know a lot of studies and a lot of these nudging studies and things like that, they try to correlate the warming itself and they look at like 10 hectopascals. But that's pretty far up in the stratosphere. The point is, is you, you somehow need to get an anomaly that's down in the lowermost stratosphere to imprint something on the tropopause. And that PV invertibility principle that I showed you, when you invert that to get the wind and the geopotential, and I said it's an elliptic operator that's non-local, changes in geopotential drop off at I think one over R, and changes in wind I think are one over R squared from the distance from the maximum of that PV anomaly, right? So that means if you have a big PV anomaly, high in the stratosphere, but nothing down at the tro tropopause, you don't have enough to really, imp uh, of a PV anomaly to imprint anything on the tropopause, and you're not gonna get, uh, or it's unlikely that you're gonna get a strong effect in the troposphere. So when people are going out there, don't necessarily think that you should just grab uh, the time periods where there's sudden warmings. Really, it's, it's the vortex variability and how vertically deep that is. So. With that, I'll just throw my summary slide up there and you guys can read that and I'll take any questions.